This is highly flammable 91% isopropyl alcohol. This is a really challenging match. <laughs> there it is. And this fireball shows just how flammable alcohol can be. <laughs> My finger's on fire. So this should be really dangerous, right? Puts it right out. Today, let's look at combustion conditions, necessities, and surprises. To set this experiment sequence, we'll need a small dish to hold the alcohol. I found a watch glass gives some nice results. I'll be using rubbing alcohol, which is called isopropyl. Prop means three carbons in alcohol because there's an OH alcohol group. I will note, you shouldn't do any part of this experiment without exercising extreme caution and use all necessary safety precautions. This alcohol is very flammable and you can get really burned. We'll start the reaction with a match. Notice how long this initial light takes. This is better observed with 70%, but the flame comes through poorly on camera. We'll light it again in a moment. You might be surprised at the difference. Here's a universe conquering Cyberman. I'm going to pass some very small alcohol droplets through the flame. Notice each puff has significantly less alcohol than is in the watch glass, yet a significantly larger flame is produced. Are you familiar with what accounts for this? That was a good one. It has to do with the ability of oxygen to bump into the alcohol. The smaller spray alcohol particles bump into oxygen atoms easier than the alcohols below the surface of the watch glass. After blowing out the alcohol, I'll immediately relight. Watch how the alcohol lights this time. It's pretty surprising. What's the difference between the initial light and this one? Temperature. This alcohol is quite hot and produces much more vapor. The vapor is what ignites. Hot flammable things are extremely dangerous. To see just how dangerous, watch this. I'll blow out the alcohol and cover it with a jar. Imagine you had a flammable substance in an enclosed space. I'm going to attempt to light a match. All I'm going to do is throw the match in front of the lip of the jar. Is that not a little scary? Always work with flammables in well-ventilated areas, because those fumes are really reactive due to the high oxygen exposure. Let's make a simple observation here. I light the alcohol, speed up the burn. Now what's left in the dish when it's done burning? It's empty. No alcohol remains. In 70%, there's a small amount of fluid. Where do you think the alcohol went? Did it just evaporate? Disappear? Let's do some experiments to find out. Fill the dish and relight the alcohol. Now let's cover the alcohol with the jar. What do you notice happens to the jar? Name two potential products that could make the jar foggy. When I feel the fog with my finger, it's quite damp, like a mirror after a long shower. But the dampness does not appear to be flammable. Does that decrease the likelihood of either of your guesses? We'll break that down in a moment. Now I'll light this tiny beaker, and I'm going to attempt to cover it while starting my stopwatch. Let's see how long it takes to go out. I'll speed it up. 20 seconds. Now if I relight the beaker and cover it again, do you think it will burn longer or shorter? Check it out. Less than two seconds. What could account for the flame going out so fast? We'll see in just a moment. The last thing I'll note, and this isn't my favorite demo to do this, but it's what I had on hand, is what happens if you put a spiraled aluminum sheet on a string above the flame. We see the aluminum begin to spin. There are a few more interesting applications to this, quite a few. If you know any, jot them down in the comments. Let's try to create a solid explanation now with all those pretty interesting and surprising experiments. We started out with the beaker full of alcohol. We'll put the initial and post-burning states. I'll just call it the initial and final. It's not really truly initial or final, but we'll work with it. We saw that as the alcohol burned, the level went down and that it produced a flame. I touched the flame a couple times, an accident once, <laughs> and it was hot, which tells me that energy was coming out of that flame. We'll call that heat Q. Rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol. Looks like this, C3H7OH. Let me rewrite that so we can see its structure. That's the alcohol. All those are hydrogens. And we saw that when we plunged the match into the alcohol, even though we had plenty of stuff to burn, plenty of alcohol, it went out. And that's because just because you have something that's flammable, you got to have something that'll take those electrons. And what's taking our electrons here is oxygen. We need the oxygen and there's not that much oxygen down inside here. There's probably a little dissolved, but not enough for combustion. 
So oxygen's going into the flame. And little fun fact, it'll get a little busy if I jot it down, but you need about 18% oxygen in order for a flame to burn. The air is typically around 21%. So you got like 3% margin. We also saw the spray bottle produce a huge flame. And when we covered the alcohol and then lit the front, we saw that nice whoosh. And we also saw that when we covered the flame, a few things happened. It got all cloudy. That cloudiness, which wasn't flammable, was water. H2O's coming out of fire. Does that surprise you? Surprised me a little when I learned about that. Something that puts out fire comes out of fire. It's like, why wouldn't it just put out the flame? And when we lit the front here, we got that big poof, because what's filling the jar? Remember, you need oxygen and alcohol for something to burn. It's burning all around in here, that's not just oxygen. <laughs> that's alcohol in there too. And it's probably hard for you to see, but another evidence is that the alcohol is not burning down in the alcohol. If you could see my angle perfectly, the flame is above the level of the alcohol, not down in it. So we might show that with something like this. Our little alcohols that are gaseous vapor are what are actually reacting with the oxygen. So heat comes out, H2O comes out, and what else comes out? When we lit, covered, and timed, we saw we got a really long time of about 20 seconds. Then when we re-lit, covered, and timed while the beaker was down, we got less than two seconds. It was about a second and a half, 1.75. I was a little slow on it. And why was that? The other thing coming out of the flame has to account for the carbons. Where's all the carbon going? The hydrogen's going into the water, but where's that carbon going? It's going into CO2, carbon dioxide, just like what you breathe out. So this overall reaction looks something like this. All of our alcohol carbons go into carbon dioxide. All of our hydrogens go where? Into the H2O. The oxygens, largely from diatomic oxygen that we're breathing, oxygen, go into the H2O and the CO2. And there's one oxygen here from the alcohol. So that overall unbalanced reaction looks like this. C3H7OH, that's alcohol reacts with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O and heat, which I'll show as Q. What we're starting with, the reactants are giving away energy in the form of heat and light predominantly, which means that what we're ending with is at a lower state of energy so what we started with had to have more energy. And that's our stereotypical exothermic reaction. We see this little hump right here. It takes a little bit of energy to get the reaction started. That's called the activation energy or energy of activation. Where did the energy for our reaction starting come from? The alcohol right now is bumping into the oxygen, but it's not reacting, thankfully, because my face is right here. So what do we have to do to get the alcohol to bang into the oxygen hard enough and in the right orientation to get this reaction started? We need to speed them up. We need some energy. And that came from the nearly two boxes of matches <laughs> that I did doing this. And did we have to keep putting matches on for this to keep burning? Obviously not. It just starts and keeps on burning. So where's the energy come from? to overcome this activation energy once it's lit from the reaction itself. And the last thing I did where the aluminum spun over the flame is interesting to me. That's called a convection current. The hot air is rising and that ends up being pretty important because if the hot air wasn't rising and taking away the CO2 and H2O, those things would want to go down and put out what's burning. They'd stop our reaction potentially like we see in the beaker.
Now, in case this unbalanced reaction bothers you, I'll balance that real quick, but that's beyond today's scope. So I'll just put it up there in case you'd like to see. We have two alcohols reacting with nine oxygens to produce six carbon dioxides and eight waters. So that means six carbons were on the reactants, two times three is six, and six times one is one, so six and six. We had 16 hydrogens on the reactants, seven plus one is eight, and then we multiply that by two, so that's 16, and then we had 16 on the products, two times eight. And we had 18 oxygen from the oxygen gas and two from this alcohol for 20 oxygens total. We had 12 oxygens from the CO2, two times six is 12, and we had eight from the water, one times eight is eight, so 12 and eight make 20 oxygens. So that's our balanced reaction. There's a lot more we could actually still do on this, but hopefully that's a fun introduction. If you like this experiment, I really like this experiment that I did somewhere in here. I think you might like it too. It'll pop up eventually. My favorite thing, like my most very favorite thing, is if you know some fun little tidbits about this, just let me know. I would love to hear about your fun, interesting facts. There's a lot of interesting things. So in the future, we could tie those in. If you've made it this far, it is beneficial for more than you and my kids and my wife and I to get to watch it if you like or subscribe this video. But I do appreciate that you made it this far. So thank you. Stay curious, and I will see you soon. Wonder, oh wonder.